This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 28 There was no instance in which the social and kindly dispositions of the Typees were more forcibly evinced than in the manner they conducted their great fishing parties. Four times during my stay in the valley, the young men assembled near the full of the moon, and went together on these excursions. As they were generally absent about forty-eight hours, I was led to believe that they went out towards the open sea, some distance from the bay. The Polynesians seldom use a hook and line, almost always employing large, well-made nets, most ingeniously fabricated from the twisted fibers of a certain bark. I examined several of them which had been spread to dry upon the beach at Nukahiva. They resembled very much our own seines, and I should think very nearly as durable. All the South Sea Islanders are passionately fond of fish, but none of them can be more so than the inhabitants of Taipee. I could not comprehend, therefore, why they so seldom sought it in their waters, for it was only at stated times that the fishing parties were formed and these occasions were always looked forward to with no small degree of interest. During their absence, the whole population of the place were in a ferment, and nothing was talked about but, Pehi, Pehi, fish, fish. Towards the time when they were expected to return, the vocal telegraph was put into operation. The inhabitants, who were scattered throughout the length of the valley, leaped upon rocks and into trees, shouting with delight at the thoughts of the anticipated treat. As soon as the approach of the party was announced, there was a general rush of the men towards the beach, some of them remaining, however, about the tea, in order to get matters in readiness for the reception of the fish, which were brought to the taboo groves in immense packages of leaves, each one of them being suspended from a pole carried on the shoulders of two men. I was present at the tea on one of these occasions, and the sight was most interesting. After all the packages had arrived, they were laid in a row under the veranda of the building, and opened. The fish were all quite small, generally about the size of a herring, and of every variety of color. About one-eighth of the whole being reserved for the use of the tea itself, the remainder was divided into numerous smaller packages, which were immediately dispatched in every direction to the remotest parts of the valley. Arrived at their destination, these were in turn portioned out, and equally distributed among the various houses of each particular district. The fish were under a strict taboo until the distribution was completed, which seemed to be effected in the most impartial manner. By the operation of this system, every man, woman, and child in the vale were at one and the same time partaking of this favorite article of food. Once I remember the party arrived at midnight, but the unseasonableness of the hour did not repress the impatience of the islanders. The carriers dispatched from the tea were to be seen hurrying in all directions through the deep groves, each individual preceded by a boy bearing a flaming torch of dried coconut boughs, which from time to time was replenished from the materials scattered along the path. The wild glare of these enormous flambeaux, lighting up with a startling brilliancy the innermost recesses of the vale, and seen moving rapidly along beneath the canopy of leaves, the savage shout of the excited messengers sounding the news of their approach, which was answered on all sides, and the strange appearance of their naked bodies, seen against the gloomy background, produced altogether an effect upon my mind that I shall long remember. It was on this same occasion that Cory Cory awakened me at the dead hour of night, and in a sort of transport, communicated the intelligence contained in the words, Pay he pay me, fish come. As I happened to have been in a remarkably sound and refreshing slumber, I could not imagine why the information had not been deferred until morning. Indeed, I felt very much inclined to fly into a passion and box my valet's ears. But on second thoughts, I got quietly up, and on going outside the house, was not a little interested by the moving illumination which I beheld. When old Marheo received his share of the spoils, immediate preparations were made for a midnight banquet. Calabashes of poey poey were filled to the brim, green breadfruit were roasted, 
and a huge cake of amar was cut up with a sliver of bamboo and laid out on an immense banana leaf. At this supper we were lighted by several of the native tapers held in the hands of young girls. These tapers are most ingeniously made. There is a nut abounding in the valley, called by the Taipees armor, closely resembling our common horse chestnut. The shell is broken, and the contents extracted whole. Any number of these are strung at pleasure upon the long elastic fiber that traverses the branches of the coconut tree. Some of these tapers are eight and ten feet in length, but being perfectly flexible, one end is held in a coil, while the other is lighted. The nut burns with a fitful bluish flame, and the oil that it contains is exhausted in about ten minutes. As one burns down, the next becomes ignited, and the ashes of the former are knocked into a coconut shell kept for the purpose. This primitive candle requires continual attention, and must be constantly held in the hand. The person so employed marks the lapse of time by the number of nuts consumed, which is easily learned by counting the bits of tapa distributed at regular intervals along the string. I grieve to state so distressing a fact, but the inhabitants of Taipei were in the habit of devouring fish much in the same way that a civilized being would eat a radish, and without any more previous preparation. They eat it raw, scales, bones, gills, and all the inside. The fish is held by the tail, and the head being introduced into the mouth, the animal disappears with a rapidity that would at first nearly lead one to imagine it had been launched bodily down the throat. Raw Fish Shall I ever forget my sensations when I first saw my island beauty devour one? O oh, heavens! Fayaway, how could you ever have contracted so vile a habit? However, after the first shock had subsided, the custom grew less odious in my eyes, and I soon accustomed myself to the sight. Let no one imagine, however, that the lovely Fayaway was in the habit of swallowing great vulgar-looking fishes. Oh no, with her beautiful small hand she would clasp a delicate little golden-hued love of a fish and eat it as elegantly and as innocently as though it were a Naples biscuit. But alas, it was, after all, a raw fish, and all I can say is that Fayaway ate it in a more ladylike manner than any other girl of the valley. When at Rome, do as the Romans do, I held to be so good a proverb, that being in Taipei I made a point of doing as the Taipees did. Thus I ate poey poey as they did. I walked about in a garb striking for its simplicity, and I reposed on a community of couches, besides doing many other things in conformity with their peculiar habits. But the farthest I ever went in the way of conformity was on several occasions to regale myself with raw fish. These being remarkably tender, and quite small, the undertaking was not so disagreeable in the main, and after a few trials I positively began to relish them. However, I subjected them to a slight operation with my knife, previously to making my repast. 